MSNBC, but I think he was on the radio and that was the bigger deal. But he used to play this game, what doesn't belong and why? And so I think sometimes we might be looking at our topics this morning or, or the incongruity as it seems and think, what doesn't belong and why? And yet, it all belongs. Uh, let me just remind you a couple of housekeeping things. There is a sign-up sheet for Dr. Lonsing's class. If you're in that, make sure you sign your name on that. And also, there's a tiny note, so read the fine print. It's just the first time in your life that fine print will be important. Okay, our topic for today is who will be a witness? And it's part of the uh, Center for Sacred Music series on the new reformation. Throughout this year, we've looked at changes in worship style and music, and uh, particularly with an eye toward the past 50 years, since coincidentally that's the time the college has been in an existence, uh, and this has been part of the college's series on uh, our celebration of its 50th anniversary. And this morning, we're going to look at changes in uh, worship. We have two special guests, Cantor Wally Shepard Briskin, who is here from Old Shalom Temple, Billy Brown Yeomans, who is on our performing artist faculty, and also director of music at Great Bridge Presbyterian. She will speak for all Protestants, uh, <laughs> <laughs> will speak for all important Jews, I will speak for everyone. Um, and George Stone is our accompanist. He is uh, also on our performing artist faculty here and director of music at Centenary United Methodist Church. So we have a host of folk here to share with you. But uh, Commander Wally was with us a couple of years ago, and he shared these three categories that struck me um, just like a bolt out of the blue of being exactly where we find contemporary Christian music and or, or modern uh, music in the Christian tradition. And so if you would just explain those three right now for us in 20 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. You've got, oh, how many do I have left? <laughs> you've got categories of music that come from uh, long before anyone can remember. You've got ones that come from a long time ago, but you can, you can pretty much trace their origins. And you've got ones that are contemporary, either uh, some would call them disposable or something that's, that fits the trend of the moment. Is it? Yes, perfect. And don't you, those of you who are active in church, whether uh, whatever your tradition, probably have found that to be uh, true in your own. And so the things we're going to look at today are those and how they sound in music in both uh, traditions and also challenges within the last 50 years. <coughs> now I think you'd all agree things change. Uh, remember this song? <laughs> or this outfit that everyone had to have? Or back further? Or back further, further? Or, um, well, I doubt there's anybody in the room that goes that far back. <laughs> but uh, I think you'll agree things change there and in worship practices too. Um, you might know a friend or two. Now, interestingly enough to me, uh, the top right is a synagogue in Chicago designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in 1957, and yet it looks quite modern. Uh, in the Christian church as well, things have changed. Uh, we now have this new custom where <coughs> screens replace stained glass. In choirs, things have changed as well, too. What used to be the standard, and this, uh, the black and white picture is from Billy's church. She was not pictured there. But, Thank um, you. <laughs> that's a great Presbyterian uh, uh, choir uh, shot. Uh, now our music and worship has changed through the times too. One of the things that we explored in our first session back in the fall that um, Dr. Craig Monson led was that as our culture changes, our worship practices change as well. But there are certain things that both Christians and Jews agree on. Um, music and worship binds us to the past. It connects us with those present who are worshiping with us. <coughs> it allows us to teach the tenets of the faith. Uh, and if you remember Happy Days, uh, there's this great episode where Patsy's trying to remember the elements on the periodic table of elements, and he can't, but he sets them to music, and he can. So just right there is all the proof you need to know how valuable music is. Otherwise, why would we have children learning that ABCDFG, you know, if they could just learn it otherwise? Mm -hmm. Music helps in that. It aids in experiencing the presence of God, engages the congregation in various ways, and throughout Jewish history and Christian history, both nothing happens without music. Uh, throughout the scriptures, it's peppered throughout. Uh, it's all part of our life. 
we also share certain musical forms, uh, call and response or antiphonal singing. Like if I said, shout to the Lord, and you said, shout, shout to the, the Lord. Lord. Thank you, two singers. <laughs> <laughs> that was excellent. Uh, cantillation, uh, ch uh, chant or chanting the, uh, the psalm, for example, is used in both. It may not be in your particular brand. Uh, of worship, but it's something we all do. Choral music, congregational music, and instrumental music are all music forms that both uh, faith groups use. And we also share in these sorts of musical accompaniments. Some better than others. <laughs> now I'm going to swipe a page from uh, Dr. Eric Mazur's book and his last lecture with us when he talked about particular challenges that we face uh, in these modern times of uh, worship design, he said you have two people in the congregation, or two groups, dwellers and seekers. The dwellers are those from the uh, post-Korean World War II uh, war vintage folk, and they are the builders, the roots putter downers, uh, the settlers in, and the joiners. They, uh, they find the institution to be far more important than the individual and will do all they can to make the institution last at the expense of the individual. Seekers, on the other hand, kind of that 60s group and after, are the drifters, searching for meaning in life as determined by their own definition of what brings them meaning, and are loyal to themselves more than to the organization. They are willing to shop around, uh, because they take themselves with them wherever they go. If they are the important thing, then uh, it all works fine for them. Now, the, the challenging part for some people is to assume that if you're this age bracket, you are this, and if you're this age bracket, you're that. That's not the case. There are people that go uh, either way. But generally speaking, these are the things that we come to in this day. Now, for some of us, when we look at... Um, and the groups that we're talking about particularly today, we need to uh, look at our timeline. And this is, uh, Dr. Monsink has called this old school PowerPoint. So for those of you in the class, in his class, that's your question. Ask him, what is old school PowerPoint? And he will give you an extra point. And if he can't remember, demand the extra point. Uh, but anyway, you'll see how long Judaism has been with us. And then here in that era where Christians like to call year zero, Christianity comes along. And then around the 7th century, Islam comes along. So we can see that we've all sort of branched in this timeline, but all three of these share God. Uh, and Christianity, where Ms. Yeomans will pick up with us, leaps off on its own, uh, breaks its own branch, and in 1517, we have the Protestant Reformation. And then from there, whoosh, just all kinds of things happen. Uh, although, Protestants like to say, it was as if a prism was held to a great light and a shimmering of colors. So there's your timeline for today and what we're going to be considering as we look at uh, these issues. Ken Tawamai, take it from there. I'm trying to keep to my timeline. <laughs> Thank you. Jewish music, as you can see there, goes way, way back to before anyone can remember. The musicologists call this indigenous. They needed a, a better term than traditional or what sounds like Jewish music or whatever. So they came up with the term indigenous. Anyone know a definition for indigenous? All the people. Yeah, all the people. yeah it's, a, it's always belonged there. Something that comes from within the particular people and has been with them since maybe the beginning. Or music that's been with us it was so long, it's as if we received it with the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. <laughs> so examples of this might be cantillation. Cantillation is the English or uh, Engl Englified, ver Anglified version of uh, a word meaning chanting the biblical text, which sounds something like, not necessarily something you can snap your fingers to, but something that, wow, that sounds old. And sure enough, it's before anyone can remember. It's been with us for a long, long time. There's nusach which is the Hebrew term, meaning the chanting of liturgical text. 
So an example of that might be Baruch Hu et Oronai HaVorach Baruch Aronai HaVorach Leolam Vayeh Baruch Aronai HaVorach Leolam Vayeh So those are melodies that go with the liturgy that are assigned to the different times and seasons of the Jewish year. Then we get to Misenai, literally melodies that have been around so long, it's as if they came from Mount Sinai, even though we can't literally imagine Moses and the Israelites boogieing down to them. But they sound a little bit like this. such a part of the Jewish tradition, even though we do know the composer, the specific composer who wrote them, so they didn't exist, of course, before those composers wrote them down, uh, that we can, they've been around so long that we consider them essential melodies, that is, the ones that most of us would agree are the authentic version of a particular melody, or the authentic tunes for a particular poem. These include, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Already we see the development of sort of a, a rhythm. It's something that you can kind of be put in meter. Uh, things like Rock of Ages, let our song praise thy saving power which is sort of where we overlap with the Protestant tradition. That's an example of uh, what they call Protestant hymnody, a style of music largely adapted from the German church in the 16th century. And you've got, O se shalom bim romav, hu se shalom aleinu, ve al kol Yisrael, ve imru, ve imru, amen. If you ask most modern Jews in America, if that was the, if there's any other melody to Oh Se Shalom Bim Roma that they can think of, no, that's, that must be the one that's the oldest, the most authentic, even though it was composed in 1963 in the state of Israel, and we know who the composer was and the first time it was premiered, and we have a recording of it from back then, and they say, you're kidding, it didn't exist in 1962? No. It's just as old as that. This brings us to modern times, which is, you can see by this uh, incredibly long line, which is just the last 200 years, which is just a drop, which is Jewish history, in, in Jewish history is very recent. The Great Reformation of Judaism, which took place in Germany, specifically in the towns of Worms and Speyer in Germany in the 1810s and the 1820s, which brought a new decorum to sanctuary services, and the emphasis on high art music was emphasized. Uh, and that also was the emphasis that was brought to America during several migrations, immigrations of, the, of Jewish people, uh, and lasted mostly without challenge until the middle of the 20th century, until about 50 years ago, which now ties in nicely with our celebration of 50 years of Virginia Westland. Typically, if you heard Psalm 150, the last of the 150 psalms, sung in an American Reformed Jewish synagogue in 1961, it might sound like this, track one, which we'll hear, which was composed about 200 years ago.
you hear your voices accompanied by organ. Does it remind you of any other melodies you might have heard that have a hallelujah as a chorus? <laughs> get a handle on that one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this very much, I believe, was influenced by uh, Handel, the Messiah. So it was a, a Jewish response in a high art sort of way of putting what we would consider the original words. <laughs> Hallelujah, as listed in the 150th Psalm to a chorus that then... And it didn't stop in 1961. You might still hear that in performed synagogues today. Yes, we have. It's true. Because of many factors, including, let's say, let's take you to the 1960s, and picture uh, ethnic pride, and equal rights for all, and a perceived need to break with the establishment. I don't know why. New melodies and styles were introduced. So in the 1970s, you might have heard Psalm 150 sounding like track two. Same words. who were exposed to more contemporary styles of service music, they were coming alive and becoming the uh, service leaders of the 1980, and we got the, of the 1980s, and we might hear Psalm 150 sounding a little bit like track four. Thank you. 
by the second or third time through, everyone is singing. Drifting through, and you're hooked immediately by the Hallelujah. Oh, I can sing this. I've, I've now heard the chorus 17 times through, and now I can sing a lot. I feel like I belong. That's the kind of music that is uh, welcoming of that a, a particular part of our congregation. So in the end, it's not as if uh, when the 1960s arrived, everything went out with the bathwater, uh, or with each change that's come over the last 50 years that we've done away with any of the, the past melodies. Uh, Au contraire, you might hear any of these melodies being sung in Jewish worship today. The innovations in contemporary melodies have not done away with the tunes of the past. I happen to live in both worlds, music of the last 50 years and of the, what we call, what we sort of imagine as ancient times. I'm a fan of almost everything old and new. There's a couple that are for me. But the big question for me is, does the, does the melody serve the purpose that we're going for? Does the melody serve the purpose I'm intending? If, we're, if we want to put it out in a certain way, do I use a particular melody to accomplish that? <coughs> I might use an ancient melody next to one that was written a few years ago if it fits the needs of the moment. And there are members of my congregation who strongly prefer the music of their childhood, and once a year we hold a service highlighting the music from a long time ago, from the first half of the 20th century, I'll say. And there are people who particularly like the newer participatory music. So if you want to go in a, a folk sense or a, uh, a slang translation of what is traditional, tradition is what folks remember from their lives. It could be from last month, from last year, from their childhood. So music is really an important of the spirituality and worship, and finding out what feels right can help people find their connections to traditions and faith. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So the, the rubric of the service, the liturgy, would be what makes it a Jewish service. If it, if it strayed too much from that, it would kind of cease to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to compare the musical preferences of the Reformed, uh, Conservative, and Orthodox Jewish traditions in America today? It's a little difficult to do that except to say in generalities what you might usually find in an Orthodox synagogue is a bunch of a cappella voices singing together, usually just males, because the females are either behind a, a screen or up in the balcony, so it would be a, a group of uh, Jewish males doing a lot of chanting, a lot of what we would would hear as <laughs> without being too stereotypical of, of that. In conservative synagogues, a lot of them um, over the 20th century have done away with organ music, any accompanied music on guitar or piano, um, but would mostly be a cappella. Although there are some conservative synagogues with a, with a capital C. Um, not that their views are conservative, but that's how they. Kind of, it's, it's a long story to get there, but <laughs> suffice it to say that within sort of the traditional ritual conservative synagogues, you probably would hear it a cappella, but more rhythmic and western sounding, and that in reform synagogues there would be this, like a giant prism has been held to the light, <laughs> and there's so much Jewish music out there that you never know what you're going to find when you walk into a reform synagogue. Okay, I'm going to have to break questions. We'll come back. We'll hear a little Christian music, and then we'll have more questions at the end. Thank you. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, when the Christian tradition began its thing, uh, after 313, when it becomes legalized, uh, chant of the um, Psalms, the Hebrew Psalms, is all that's used in worship for about a thousand years. That and the uh, ordinary of the Mass, if you're in the Roman Catholic tradition, that will have special meaning for you. And so Billy's going to chant us something right now mm -hmm. to give us an example of that. It was very important that nothing moved below the waist. If you catch my drift. <laughs> now I'll make note of that. <laughs> this is the Sanctus, uh, or the Holy, Holy is the Lord. And, and actually, this is not going to be in Latin. This will be in English.
1800s, we come to a time when congregational hymnody had wide variety in texts and wide variety in its metrical um, standards and wide variety in tunes. And for the first time, words are interlined with the music so that it appears the way we think of music today. Prior to, you'd have a separate textbook and a separate tune book. And each congregation may only know 10 or 12 tunes, and the song leader would yell out which one. But so we come to Holy, 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 another setting of uh, the song Tus. And Billy, it's your turn. Yeah. <laughs> Just a stanza of this traditional English hymn. I was miserable looking, but I can remember 
I mean, it's been 50 years, and I can remember the crinkly itching of that outfit to this day. <laughs> it was the era of huge crinolines, and they were stiff and scratchy. Oh, I don't know why you do that to a child. But at the time the college started, no bride would dare get married in the Christian church without the Lord's Prayer, this version being sung. And so we are going to show you what those we're enjoying them, even and, though it's and I, in the 30s. Well, and I can tell you that in addition to numerous weddings, uh, this particular setting of the Lord's Prayer I've done for any number of occasions, celebratory occasions, um, uh, installations for people in worship services, uh, many memorial services. Uh, it's still just kind of a standard uh, piece, and still is today, even though... You will agree, I think, when you hear it, if you've never heard it before, it is rather dated. <laughs> <laughs> Sacred Music Summer Conference and did it with a mass choir. Billy's going to sing that 
he did a worship service actually at, at my church, and one thing my choir particularly loved about having him there was that he took off his shoes and he went barefoot all over the chancel playing the piano and the organ. They thought that was really neat, <laughs> that he felt free enough to go barefoot during the worship service. Billy, get Mark Miller back. <laughs> but this goes to, uh, we were talking about soloistic things, and now here we have a, um, uh, an anthem where the entire choir would sing this same text. In fact, my choir did it this past Sunday.
God is more powerful and greater than that. So I would hope you would go out of here to, to <laughs> have an impact in your congregation wherever you are. Go out being neutral. Uh, I will tell you, though, that in the um, more contemporary Christian tradition, God is definitely a man. Uh, we have reverted back. There yeah. is that that theology that you're speaking of is strong in uh, what I would call modern hymnody. Yes. Uh, but in contemporary Christian, it's he, 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 he. Yeah. So it's sort of like you had this and then skipped and went. And now was the question really to you? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer, because... You know, we're Jews. We have to have you know several opinions on on one thing. In the original Hebrew, it's both uh, masculine and non-gender specific. That the the reference to God, but God is also referred to in certain aspects as you get through more contemporary. Uh, as uh, there are female aspects to God, and the modern take on it was in the especially in the 1970s. Let's change all the prayer books to get away with He and put just God in there and not reference to a specific. Uh, masculinity or gender, and the and that, that's continued through the modern prayer books and the uh, in contemporary Judaism. But there are also those who say, you know what? I can I know that God was originally tagged as non-gender specific. So even if it says He, I know what I believe. Thank you. One more question. I noticed uh, in the participatory. Uh, saw the Alleluia, it sounded as if uh, the drifter, uh, the secular Jew who may be against a temple for weddings uh, could walk in and sing right along. It seemed as if it doesn't require a knowledge of Hebrew. Is that a trend uh, for some of this uh, new music? I'd say that's always a balance that strive to be that, 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 that we try that we strive for would be something that's easy enough for anyone walking in the door to be able to do, but also for the see it wasn't the drifter, it was it wasn't seekers, it was the founders, the, the other one that were the dwellers. dwellers. For the dwellers who do appreciate uh, sort of a deeper understanding of Hebrew, that they're coming back week to week and that it's not <laughs> to to uh, borrow a, a phrase from earlier Judaism in a, a a juvenile version of or infantilizing Judaism by by spoon feeding uh, uh, to songs in English or with very few Hebrew words. Mm -hmm. So try to strike a balance between that that which is easy to pick up and that which is a little more on a deeper level. We uh, have come to the end of our time. Would you join me in thanking Billy and? And if you want to see both of us, uh, yeah. come any Friday night yeah, to the right. Temple because it really is our... In the choir. Yes, that's right, in the choir. Right.